So today we're going to talk about mental health care for BIPOC communities, and I'm excited to have with us today Dr. Jenny Wang, clinical psychologist, author, and founder of Asians for Mental Health, Dr. Joy uh, Harden Bradford, the uh, founder of Therapy for Black Girls and a licensed psychologist, and Adriana Alejandre, the founder of Latinx Therapy and a trauma therapist. Good to have you all with us today. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being you. here. Um, so the United States has been grappling with a mental health crisis, and I think by extension, the world for a while. And then you add in the last three years of the pandemic, when there's been isolation, there's been loss, trauma. We've seen our social interest infrastructures not meet us where we need to be. And so I think, you know, it's so important for us to talk about the anxiety, the loneliness, the, the stigma that exists in our communities today. And so I'm just really excited to have you here. So I'm gonna start with a question um, for all of you. First, I'd love for our audience to get to know you a bit better. So um, can you tell us a bit about your background, your work, and what inspires you to do what you do? And Dr. Joy, I'm gonna start with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, I am a psychologist and the founder of the Platform Therapy for Black Girls, which includes a therapist directory, as well as a weekly podcast and a private membership community. And really all of our work is centered on making mental health more relevant and accessible for Black women and girls. I know we will dive into more of the stigma related to mental health, but it felt really important for me to create a space and resources for Black women and girls to really be able to prioritize their mental health, for them to be able to tap into conversations and strategies to really help them to figure out how to better take care of themselves. Um, so I'm really excited about all of the incredible work we've been doing. Um, I'm also releasing my first book this summer called Sisterhood Heals that really is like a culmination and a celebration of Black women's relationships with one another. So I'm excited to continue that conversation through the book as well. Congratulations. Thank um, you. I'm gonna pass the mic to Dr. Jenny Wong. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So, um, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist and so I have a private practice here in Houston, but then I also um, created the platform Asians for Mental Health on social media. And really, you know, it was just wanting to center the voices of Asian diaspora in kind of the topic of mental health, because it's still such a highly stigmatized topic within our communities across our elders, across our different generations. And so wanting to speak to the unique nuances of being a child of immigrants, perhaps, um, a child who's raised in a country that sometimes doesn't feel like a homeland to us and what it's like to live in that kind of in-between space. Um, so Asians for Mental Health similarly has um, a therapist directory for Asian identified therapists um, and really just trying to uh, increase kind of access to culturally reverent and informed care. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. Adriana. Yes. So I'm officially a licensed marriage and family therapist here in the state of California, and I do own a group practice called EMDR and Trauma Therapy Center, um, where we provide uh, services for individuals, couples, and families that experience trauma and anxiety primarily, but open to other ex lived experiences as well. And outside of this group practice, I am the founder of Latinx Therapy, where I am a speaker, a consultant. Um, Latinx Therapy focuses on destigmatizing mental health myths and taboos in the Latinx community. And like Dr. Joy and Dr. Jenny Wang, we also have a uh, directory, um, a national directory of Latinx therapists, where I believe now 97% of our directory are members are Spanish speakers. Um, there's also a speakers directory for therapists that are also keynote speakers and panelists. So it's um, really exciting to work with a lot of these therapists on the platform and amplify one another and our work, because a lot of times being in private practice, it's, you know, we're behind closed doors, right, working with our clients. And so this membership serves to create community and also 
um, provide education to our community about um, mental health in English and in Spanish. Thank you. This is such a powerhouse panel. So I'm happy to be able to chat with the three of you today. Um, so one of the things that came up when pretty much all of you were, were introducing yourselves was around um, stigma in your communities. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, sort of what kind of challenge does that pose for you in the work that you do and the help that you're trying to provide? Um, you know, I think a lot of times there's been a lot of miseducation about what mental health even is in the Asian American community. Um, a lot of times in our homelands, the reference points were severe psychosis, institutionalization, very severe forms of mental disruption. And so I think when, you know, a lot of our parents immigrated to the U.S., that was something that it was like, our people don't do that, right? We don't do mental health. We don't do therapy. And so in some ways, it also became something where it was very much silenced. If people did struggle, it was very hush-hush. We didn't openly discuss it. And in fact, when we did, we felt like we would be tarnishing the reputations of our parents, our community, the people that we came from, right? So there's a deep sense of silence and also shame surrounding mental health. And so a lot of times, you know, either when I'm working with clients or speaking, you know, in corporate settings, a lot of it is realizing that that silence actually breeds worse mental health outcomes. And so a lot of my time is spent almost like re-educating and normalizing and helping people realize that mental health is rooted in our relationships, in how we live our lives, the actions and choices that we make, um, and helping people see that mental health is every single minute of every day. That is what mental health really is. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I really appreciate that answer, Dr. Jenny, because I think in a lot of ways in the Black community, it's a very similar kind of a narrative. And I think the additional piece of religion and spirituality being mm -hmm. a large part of Black, Black communities experience, right? And so this idea that mental illness comes from not having a strong enough faith relationship or that you're cursed in some way, um, when really, you know, you can pray and also see a therapist, right? I think it's really important for people to understand that those things are not mutually exclusive. And so it's not a denouncing of your faith relationship to say that you also see a therapist. And again, the expansion of the conversation of mental health being something that we all have to take care of, right? Like that it actually exists along a spectrum. So it's not that only people who have severe mental illness need to do something. There are things that all of us need to be doing to take care of our mental health. Absolutely. I resonate with that. Um, my community shares similar experiences, if not the same, to a very close degree. And um, so to add, add a different light to this, I think when I started my platform, one of the stigmas that I remember uh, from childhood and, and growing up is that one, um, in Spanish is la terapia es para locos, that therapy is only for crazy people, as you were just referencing, right, Dr. Joy, that it's for extreme cases. And that's not the case. I think, you know, in expanding Latinx therapy, it's really learning that, um, learning and teaching that therapy is not just for rock bottom moments, that it can very much be preventative and even not not just necessarily going into therapy, but learning about your mental health, creating that awareness is prevention. Um, because as you mentioned, Dr. Jenny, right, when we stay silent in it, it can become very dangerous for ourselves and the people around us. And all three of us as well come from very collectivistic cultures where we tend to prioritize the needs of other people versus our own individual needs. And so learning about how mental health can impact one and how it could help one, it actually ends up benefiting others as well. And so these are just things though that we have to reframe, that we have to learn about. And I think that's why our platforms exist is to um, combat these stigmas, these myths, these misconceptions and taboos. Um, within my lived experience and also for, I'm sure for many of, of our people in our community, we also don't learn about mental health because it's so much of a stigma until we're in like 
college years, um, you know, young adulthood ages, when there's something that happens to us, most likely, where somebody ends up telling us, hey, I think you, you know, it, it may be helpful to consider therapy, or it may be helpful to talk about this with someone else. Because growing up, the even the expression of emotions was so oppressed, right? We couldn't even show anger. We couldn't even show sadness. And so learning how to accept these emotions and express them becomes so challenging when we're, I mean, at, at any age, but definitely when we're interacting in relation to other people and with others. So uh, stigmas everywhere and, you know, in all contexts of our lives. Yeah. I mean, definitely, I know stigma is a big one. We could probably spend the entire panel just talking about stigma, yeah. um, and we would fill the entire time. Um, but what would you say, um, and, and I'm going to go around the room one more time, so to speak, um, what would you say outside of the stigma is one of the biggest barriers um, to to mental health care access that are facing your that is facing your community today, and I, I'll um, I'll go in reverse order <laughs> and ask Adriana to go first. Sure, thank you. So for my community, largely and historically, it's been not having providers that speak Spanish and or indigenous languages. Um, and, and still, that, that's still a struggle. Representation matters. We hear that time after time in different settings, it, in therapy as well. It's very different to experience therapy with a translator in the room with you while you're trying to be vulnerable. There is a disruption. There is a need to build rapport with both you know, the therapist and also the translator. And typically that's also not their role or they choose for that to not be their role. And so um, uh, language accessibility has, has been huge um, for us in our community, being able to find someone that is also um, culturally congruent, affirming, um, that identifies with you, that shares similar lived experiences, um, and can also um, digest or rather help you understand the concepts of mental health and therapy in digestible ways. As a provider myself that is bilingual, that's been my, my biggest barrier and challenge for my community is having to teach myself these concepts from graduate school and these advanced trainings now as a licensed professional and having to translate them myself for the sake of my community being able to digest them. So I need to digest it, I need to take time, and then I need to learn how to um, say it. And that <laughs> makes my bilingual brain hurt a little bit sometimes, but with the help of my community, right, it makes it a little bit easier. But nonetheless, it's still a barrier. Thank you. And, and Dr. Jenny, what are you saying? Yeah, I would say that similarly, language is a huge barrier. And, you know, the term Asian Americans is a very wide one. So when you think about all the different ethnic groups um, and the waves of immigration here to the United States, we're talking about, you know, 20, 30, 40 potentially or more different languages and dialects. Um, and so I think that has been a huge challenge. And especially for people of perhaps my generation are younger who are more open to mental health, but then we don't know what the words are when we're trying to explain it to our parents, right? That older generation. And so sometimes the, the concepts translate and sometimes they don't. They're not necessarily certain words for diagnoses in some cultures. Um, and so I think even getting to a similar Kind of conversational ground is half the battle, kind of what Adriana was mentioning earlier. I think also that kind of cultural and also racial um, reverence piece is really big. You know, I think as Asian Americans, we're kind of seen as almost this like middle space, like where we're going through different struggles that may not always resonate with many different communities. And so sometimes I feel like for many of my clients, they have felt like their race was never acknowledged. They were part of what people call an invisible race here in the United States. And yet post pandemic with the rise of anti-Asian fate, our race became so much more salient. 
And many of us didn't have the language or the words to even process our own experiences. So I think in many ways, finding a therapist who perhaps understands some of those similarities, who understands intergenerational traumas that people from Asia have come with, all of those things are really hard to find. I always say marriage or dating or um, finding a therapist is like dating, right? It's like finding that nice dance with somebody that is safe and that you can trust. Right. But then who also like just understands fundamental, fundamental things about how you were raised and the challenges that you may have experienced it, it and how that might have impacted you before you even came in the door. Right. And that's absolutely that's a big deal. Yes. Big and deal. and I think the piece of not um, seeing our cultural values as a deficit. Right. I think there's something about kind of Western models of mental health that say, oh, that cultural practice is the reason why you have this mental health problem instead of understanding the value of it and the limitations of it. Right. A hundred percent. Dr. Joy, how about you? What are, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo the same sentiments. I think um, for all of us, like a lack of culturally responsive providers, but at this point, where we are kind of in the pandemic, I think a lack of providers overall is is really difficult. You know, I don't know that I know any therapists that really don't have a wait list right now, you know? And so I think the rise in mental health or the rise of people seeking mental health, of course, is great, but the provider um, bandwidth has not been able to keep up, right? And so I think that that is an additional barrier um, in addition to the stigma that we've talked about. I think an additional barrier is finances slash insurance. Um, you know, so I think, you know, we cannot deny that, you know, quality care is expensive in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, a lot of people can't afford it, especially as we have a little recession and, you know, those kinds of things. But the other thing I think we have to pay attention to is that insurance companies have not necessarily made it easy for providers to kind of keep up with taking insurance and also being able to support themselves in their lives, right? And so what we're seeing is that lots of therapists are unfortunately not even able to accept insurance anymore because it became such a hassle to be able to be paid for the services that they were providing, which then means that clients are not able to use the benefits that they've been paying for. And so it feels like there's this tension that has been created between like therapists and clients related to insurance when really it is not the therapist issue, right? Um, so I think we, we do have to pay attention to that as an additional barrier in addition to the things we've talked about. Yes, I, I had on my list to, to talk about today, the fact that, you know, there's so many people who may have insurance. It, and even if you have insurance, you can't find a provider who's covered. And then federal the federal law around parity and and what that looks like state by state is also very confusing and so the access can be difficult and 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 this is one of those topics that again we could talk about for the rest of the time like all the barriers to, to getting access to mental health care um but what I wanted to talk about was you know if you are experiencing barriers to accessing care or to, to accessing mental health services what else can you do for your mental health? What is practical outside of the bounds of the system that may not be working for us right now? I think what's lovely is that we have a lot of mental health professionals from diverse backgrounds who are writing books, right? Dr. Joy has a book coming out um, and my book come out in last May as well, where they're really centering voices of different communities. And I think that's so exciting for the mental health space because it means that um, you know you may not be in crisis you may not necessarily need a therapist right now but people are offering their expertise their experiences with clients in tangible books right that have tools and questions and prompts and you know I think sometimes when you read some of these books you can almost imagine a therapist saying these things to you, like these questions and prompts. And so I think those options are out there. And I think that's why a lot of professionals spend a lot of time writing these books is because we know that we're not going to see every single person that needs help, but a book is something that they can pick up hopefully or read, you know, an ebook and have access to that. I'm also a big proponent that, 
our bodies hold things related to our mental health in a way that we don't fully understand. And so we know that movement, stretching, exercise, rhythmic dancing, drum circles, things that are embodied somatic movements help the body regulate the nervous system. And so even going for a walk today, even moving your body has benefits to mental health. And I always say to my clients, if you're not doing the basics, sleeping, eating, right? Connecting right with people, spending time outside. If you're not doing those things, then all these other things that you try to put on top of it are going to be really shaky. So I think those basic human needs are things that we could all do today. And in fact, improve on if we're already doing them. Mm, thank you for that reminder. Thank you. Needed it. <laughs> yeah, I would just add to that. In addition to books, you know, there are a plethora of podcasts. Um, so I'm very excited that there are so many, you know, credible mental health podcasts from licensed professionals talking about some of the things that Dr. Wang is talking about, you know. So again, I think because we come from identities and communities where we know, you know, psychology and the mental health field was not necessarily built for us, it's been really exciting to see so many professionals like create these resources to be able to serve our communities in the ways that we might not be able to in our individual offices. And so I think being able to plug into podcasts, or worksheets or, you know, lots of therapists are creating courses and offering workbooks and all kinds of different things for people to be able to tap into. So I think making sure that you're keeping your eyes open for those kinds of resources. The other thing that I'm really excited about that I hope I see more of are groups. Um, so mm -hmm. therapy groups, support groups, like I feel like there's, you know, more of that now, but I think we could use more um, just because again, there are not enough therapists to go around for everybody who would want to have individual therapy. But I do think the power of group therapy is something we have not tapped into enough. And so I would love to see, you know, an increase in groups being offered in community centers, through private practices, support groups facilitated by community members. I think, you know, as Adriana mentioned, having a more collectivist background really lends itself to people being able to heal in community within groups. And so I'd like to see people really kind of take up that banner as well. Yeah, I think there definitely is a power in in groups and always a need, you know, definitely. So I was going to mention that, but I also had the thought of how powerful our minds are. And this exercise is something that I teach um, people in my communication skills workshop group and then also in, in my practice in which I think it's really important for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and talk to ourselves, you know, say what we want to say out loud and not just keeping things in our mind, because in our mind, sometimes we may have a different voice, but then when we hear, you know, our own self out loud, it could come out very differently than how we imagined it would. So I always encourage people to practice saying things out loud and practice kind dialogue as well to themselves, because there's so many people that suffer very silently in a, a very critical self-talk type of way. Um, so I definitely recommend for us to just express kindness and just practice communicating out loud within ourselves to ourselves in front of a mirror so that you could also learn what your nonverbal language expression looks like. Um, and besides that, you know, just on the more like logistical note, there are therapy funds out there that like um, the Loveland Foundation, I just created the Alejandra Foundation. Um, there is, if, if they're still around, Brown Sister Speaks and, and other ones that I've, I've promoted on my page that provide also therapy services. They reimburse you for your therapy or pay the therapist directly. And so these are other ways maybe to get access to mental health therapy services. Um, and there's usually also resources available on their websites for other alternatives to therapy as well. I want to flip this around a little bit because we're, we're talking about folks who are seeking access to mental health care. But what if, you know, you're, you're watching this today and you're one of the folks who is privileged enough to have mental health care or to be able to afford to pay for it. So you have privilege or you have access to services. Is there anything that you can do 
to help make mental health resources more available and more accessible to others? Um, yeah, this, this is a great question because it, it can get very creative with people that are able to, um, you know, just have access to their own services. But I, since launching Latinx Therapy, I have worked with individuals who have brought this idea to me in which where they fund therapy sessions um, at a certain rate for an X number of people. And I think that's a really wonderful way of giving back to the community. And sometimes, you know, people think like, well, what about HIPAA and what about confidentiality, right? They don't have, they're just, they provide the payment essentially. And then the um, services are paid for up front. Um, so anyways, there's logistics. If, if anybody watching is able to do that, just contact someone who can engage in that contact directory services, right? Like ourselves, and we can probably work it out in some way. But another way is for, as Dr. Joy, I believe you were the one that mentioned groups. And if individuals want to lead a peer support group, you can go ahead and do that, right? You can, there's a lot of research. I know Mental Health America actually has a curriculum, um, a public curriculum, curriculum as to how you can go ahead and organize a peer-led support group and um, facilitate that, you know, essentially just create a space or even co-working spaces are great. Those are not necessarily support groups, but just being in community with other people. Yeah, I love this question because I think it really orients towards what community care looks like and what it could look like across communities. Um, and I always say that like, if I'm a regulated person, then I show up that way with the people that I touch, right? My kids, my parents, the people that are in my life. And so I think I, I think one of the ways that we can dispel some of the myths is if we're comfortable sharing, talk to people about how we go to therapy, right? And I'll tell my kids, mommy has a therapy session today or so. You got to be quiet, but mommy's going to have a session, right? And it's one of those things where we start to normalize it and we actually tell people about the benefits of it because I think therapy can be really scary, right? And in our community, it's like, why would you pay a stranger to talk about our family secrets, right? That feels like a big no-no. When in fact, when we create space for ourselves to be in therapy, it actually frees us up, right? To really work on the things that improve our lives. And we also don't need to, be projecting our stuff to all these people that we love. And so I think that we are the best kind of advertising for therapy. If we've seen benefit, then let's talk about it. If we've taken medication and it's been beneficial, let's talk about it. And I think that then creates a lot of ripple effects for others. Yeah, you know, Dr. Wang, it's funny because I often get the question from people like, how do I encourage my partner to go to therapy or how do I get my dad into therapy, right? And really modeling that, like you just said, modeling what you've learned in therapy and that you've had a great relationship with the therapist or you've had, you know, benefits from medication is the best way to get somebody else to go to therapy because then they can see the tangible changes you've made in your life and they can see the changes that have happened in your relationship. And so I think when we think about trying to get other people to therapy, it's really important to look at, again, ourselves as walking billboards and really mm -hmm. allowing that to speak for itself. Yeah, indeed. Um, so I have some individual questions for y'all, and we can talk about those. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Joy. Um, so I read somewhere that you like using pop culture analogies to really bring home psychological concepts to, to your clients. So what is um, one of your favorite pop culture anecdotes that you use to really drive those things home? Ooh, this feels like an unfair question because I feel like so many good um, pop culture references. Um, but I feel like one of my favorites is from the show Girlfriends. Um, so for those who are not familiar, Girlfriends was a show that was on, I think, in the early 2000s for Black women who were friends in California about, you know, their lives and like the happenings of what was going on. Um, and so in season three, um, there was one of the characters named Tony who got engaged and her best friend, Joan, 
um, was somebody who was kind of like always wanting to be partnered, but it just was never really happening for her. So Tony got engaged first. And what we saw in season three was that Joan threw the engagement party, but in the middle of the engagement party had her ex-boyfriend come over to like collect his box of things that he had left at the home, right? And so I think that that is just a great illustration of what happens when we avoid difficult conversations with other people in our life, right? So clearly Joan had been struggling with the idea that her best friend got engaged before she did, but didn't feel like it was appropriate to share that. And so instead of actually verbalizing like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Can we talk about it? What happens is that she acts out in the middle of the engagement party, right? And I think a lot of people can recognize that for themselves, like it chance in experiences they've had where they didn't want to say something, but they ended out ended up like acting out what was happening anyway. Um, so I think that that's just a great example of really the importance of having difficult conversations, even if they're awkward. Um, I think people are often afraid to have some of those awkward, difficult conversations because they are afraid it means that the relationship will be over or you know, this friend will never forgive me for saying I'm jealous, when really what often happens is that the relationship becomes closer. Thank you. That was, I was interested in hearing what it was gonna be and it did not <laughs> Um, juicy story. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Wang, you, Dr. Wang, you, in, you answered this a little bit earlier, um, but I, I wanted to dig a little bit more into into your book. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about the importance of professionals like yourself um, putting together your stories, especially the ones that that uh, impact your community. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your book and kind of why you decided that now was the time? Mm. Yeah, so the book um, is called Permission to Come Home, Reclaiming Mental Health as Asian Americans. And I think I wanted this book to be a love letter to our community. You know, it came out over the course of the pandemic. I was writing much of it while we were under lockdown. And this was at the same time that we were getting videos and footage of our Asian elders getting pushed on the streets or being attacked, you know, and people having to at some point go back to work and they were scared to get on the subways because there were Asian American women who were being pushed in front of them. And so it was a very terrifying time for our community. And I think one in which many of us felt sometimes helpless how does this, how do we get out of this, right? How do we move through this? And so I think the book really came at a time in our community's kind of almost a journey where we needed some tangible tools, right? And every chapter is a permission to do something, permission to rage, permission to take up space, permission to feel, permission to grieve. And I wanted our community to feel like they could claim permission to do those things. Because like Adriana mentioned earlier, we were never taught to feel anything, right? And so, so much of it was, can we turn inward and tolerate the discomfort of facing the really painful things of our lives that we had long suppressed? And so I think this book was a love letter, but it also was a tangible thing that I could leave my kids who will one day be young adult Asian Americans questioning who they are, questioning if they belong, questioning where they came from. And I wanted them to have a resource to be able to turn towards those questions. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Adriana, you do, you mentioned this like off the top that you do work um, in EMDR. And uh, for the folks who may not be as familiar with what it is, can you tell us a little bit about what is EMDR? And then are there challenges that are specific um, to, to the Latinx community that it's been particularly successful in? in addressing or helping? Absolutely, thank you for the question. So EMDR 
is an acronym for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a type of type of therapy that uses bilateral stimulation, left and right movement. Um, it originated le with left and right movement of the eyes, but it can be left and right movement of the hands. So if we just tap like this, this is called a butterfly hug in order to help the, the brain heal from the specific experience that you're going to be working on with your therapist. And so this type of therapy uses um, eight phases in order to help you process. And there is a phase where you gather the history about it, then you prepare for this type of therapy, because it isn't like talk therapy, there's drastically less talking, there is more stimulation than talking, because your brain and your body are going to be getting activated from this specific chosen problem you're going to bring up. And this problem can be a belief you have about yourself based off of something that happened. It can be a sensation in your body. There may not even be a memory connected to it because sometimes things happen in our infancy or childhood and we can't articulate it. Or there could be an image of precise memory. Um, so you can choose, you know, a different, a sensation, an image or a belief of what you want to process. And it's it's really a beautiful type of therapy. Of course, I'm biased in it because I've been providing it for years and I've seen the the success in it. Um, but, you know, to your second question in regards to um, are there any challenges particularly to the Latinx community? I'm, I'm going to just spread that out to marginalized communities, because as we're hearing in this panel, we share so many different experiences. I have worked with people um, uh, that have traumas due to immigration. Um, and again, so many of our cultures can experience that as well. It's It's been successful in so many different areas of people's lives. Um, again, immigration, or it can be due to anxiety, it can be addictions, um, it can be helpful for the way that we perceive ourselves and or others. There's just so many different things that um, it, it, it helps, it's effective for. So it's, it's really difficult to target. But I will say that it's, I guess, specific to the Latinx community, using it in Spanish, because now they have access you know, to EMDR, um, terapia ocular is how I refer to it with my clients after I explain what it is. And so I think it's been successful because it can be used, you know, um, in that way. And we change the metaphors in a way that is helpful to our community. I have one more question for you, Dr. Joy, and then we're going to go into our final question of the panel. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had a book coming out, and um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna lob the other the same question to you about. Can you tell us a little bit about it and why you felt like it was needed now? Mm -hmm. So it's called Sisterhood Heals: The Transformative Power of Healing in Community, which I feel like is a beautiful summation of the conversation we're having today. Um, and I think it is really important to focus on our relationships with one another um, because it can be. To I think Dr. Wing mentioned this earlier: this idea of things that we hold as secrets and that we are afraid to say out loud. But then you get into a group or you're having a, a you know late night chat session with your girlfriend. And you say this thing that you've finally been holding and you realize like, oh my gosh, it wasn't so scary and this person can hold it for me. And so I think as we are kind of moving into whatever this phase is of the pandemic we are in right now, people are really wanting to figure out like, how do I reveal relationships? What does it mean for um, me to even show up in community? Like, how do I hold space for other, other people? But how do I also ask for people to hold space for me? And so the book is really a celebration of the relationships that Black women have with one another and how we are often each other's lifeline and a guide to how to do that better. Okay. Sounds like um, folks are going to have a TBR list at the end of <laughs> today's session. Indeed. Okay. So for each of you, um, there are some very unique challenges in the work that you do. And 
what I am interested in wrapping up with are, um, tell me about the things that give you hope. The things that give you hope um, in, in mental health access or anything related to mental health in your community? Well, I think, you know, I remember going to graduate school and being one of the only, if not only Asian in so many settings. And so what gives me hope is this next generation of Asian therapists who are sometimes going against their parents' wishes and becoming a therapist or becoming a psychologist and going against the stigma within our culture and saying, this is something that matters and we want to be a part of that. Um, and so I think when I see these, you know, young graduate students, young interns, postdocs, that gives me hope because it makes me realize that there are generations to come who will continue to be dedicated to our community and providing care that makes people feel safe and heard. Um, and I'm also just really galvanized by young people. You know, people love to say like, oh, these young people, this and that. And I'm like, but they're doers and they're movers and they're shakers. And they're using their unique talents and gifts to be creative and to start movements and to fight back. And that gives me hope, even though sometimes it feels like every day there's something to feel hopeless about. But I have to believe that these young people will give us the future that they want for themselves and that we as older folks, hopefully, are good mentors and cheerleaders for them. Um, I'm also really excited about just the, the vulnerability that I see Black women and Black people in general really sharing about their mental health experiences. I think that every time somebody is able to say like, I've struggled with this thing and here's how I'm trying to take care of myself. It gives someone else the, the, the privilege and the opportunity to say, oh, I can say this thing too, or I can also get help for this thing. And so I've just been really encouraged by people getting on social media saying like, oh, I had this great session with my therapist today. Let me tell you what they told me, right? And so really being able to kind of be proud about, you know, receiving support and offering other people things that might be helpful for them, right? Like, I think there isn't always clarity around what you can talk with the therapist about. And so people being very open to sharing their own experiences with therapy, I think also expands other people's possibilities of what therapy can be used for. Definitely. And my brain is like ping ponging all over the place with different answers. So I'm trying to ground myself with just one thing. <laughs> but you know, when I launched my podcast, one of the most memorable things that I remember um, from going viral is that people were just emailing me like in the beginning, I got maybe like over 20 emails a week or something like that. It was pretty uh, difficult to keep up for me. And all of them were like, I never realized I can choose a Latinx therapist. I, I never thought I had a choice. I always just went with whatever was given to me. You know, it, it, it they all shared that theme of just like uh, they crave to heal and they never thought that they had a right to choose their provider. And so it gives me hope that our communities crave and long to heal and long to break generational cycles and long to not be oppressed anymore. Um, and, and yes, like I think all generations are definitely um, doing their part and, and doing the best they can given the stigmas that they've grown up with and have witnessed. And so I, I see a lot of hope in the direction that we're doing. I mean, all of us here have created something our communities needed and our communities are using them, which is why we continue to be in existence. So the hope, the hope is there and it's beautiful. And I think us as leaders and our communities are, we're doing something together and it's working. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that's a great note to end on because we need hope. So I thank you for your, for all of your thoughtful responses today, um, for your time. We appreciate you being with us, and I'm I'm really most excited uh, for folks to to hear from you all today because so many gems were dropped. Um, so I appreciate you all. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having us.
And uh, we're going to go to Amanda Zamora, the 19th co-founder and publisher.